events happening this week and this month. Um, for example, tomorrow is Porch Fest in downtown Bloomington. We'll be having an open house at um, the Laurel Ave Community Garden on 128 Laurel Avenue. Uh, it's free and open to the public. There will be live music and there will be live music at many other stages that day as well. That's free and open to the public. Um, the other upcoming events that we have for the month of September and beyond is um, we have our seed saving workshop with Lisa Bloodnick from Binghamton University Libraries on Wednesday, September 1st. This is over Zoom in collaboration with Binghamton University Libraries. We're actually going to take a virtual tour of her, of her farm in Appalachian, and she's going to teach us some of the tricks of the trade of saving seeds um, for all these favorite fruits and vegetables. We're going to have a Ghanaian cooking workshop. This is a very popular workshop last year with the Bybee Davis family. It's going to take place uh, at the Lee Barter Community Center at 108 Liberty Street in Binghamton. Um, it's also going to be available on Zoom and Facebook Live if you want to cook along at home. And we're going to be learning how to make a traditional West African soup called peanut butter soup. So if you want to learn something new to do with peanut butter, please join us on Wednesday, September 8th at 5.30, either online or in person. Um, we do need volunteers for building our newest community garden. Um, that's going to be on September 11th as part of the United Way Day of Caring at 22 New Street on the south side of Binghamton. It's kind of uh, near the Islamic Awareness Center and the Hole in the Wall restaurant, kind of nested between those two establishments. Um, you do need more people. So if you want to do something special on September 11th, please join us in building a new community garden. Finally, our most popular workshop, workshop from last year is that. This is going to be on Wednesday, October 6th. It's a garlic growing workshop with our urban farm manager, Cynthia Averett. It's going to be 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. at the Binghamton Urban Farm on 16 Cooter Street. It is also going to be streamed, streamed uh, live on Zoom and Facebook Live. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome Linda. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for inviting me. Could you make the uh, share the screen? Prevention or the presentation full screen yes, and indeed. presenter view thanks so thanks for inviting me here I'm glad to be here at ross park zoo for pollinator weekend that's cool uh yeah one there you go nice okay and here to uh talk about Beneficial insects, so that will include pollinators, but there are lots of others, so we want to <clears throat> make it a little more uh, all encompassing so uh, all beneficial insects. Uh, so, like she said, my name is Linda Swoboda I am the horticulture program educator at uh, Cornell cooperative extension Broome county that's at 840 upper front street and uh, so my role there is a program educator and master gardener volunteer coordinator and i also manage the cutler botanic garden which is a three and a half acre demonstration garden having 13 different themed areas and one of them is our native habitat area where you will see lots of native plants that are beneficial to insects. Okay, so I, now I need to advance, thanks. All right, so um, most people have strong attitudes towards insects. They're usually in one of two camps. They're either, yeah, I have bugs in my yard or, oh my God, I have bugs in my yard and I need to do something. Well, you usually don't have to do anything. And if you have bugs in your yard, that might be a really good, a uh, sign of a healthy ecosystem. So we're gonna take a look at some of the good guys. And uh, next slide, please. So there's a lot of bugs out there, right? There are about a million species that have been identified, lots more that have not been identified. And that's species, that's not individuals. So within a species, you probably have millions and millions of individuals. So just like 1% of all those are considered serious pests, you know, agricultural pests. 
and less than 1% are considered occasional pests. So they might, you know, be uh, seasonal invaders, get in your homes or, you know, cause a problem somehow. Um, so there's a lot more good or just plain indifferent, you know, lots of bugs that we don't even encounter in our day-to-day -day activities. Hey, Linda. Yeah. Um, there's some sort of problem with Zoom. I'm going to try and show the workshop in a different mode. Is that okay? Okay. Does that fix the problem, Chris? Uh, no, it's still there. I don't know what happened. So we're going to do it. Uh, there you go. That's working? That's working. <laughs> Yeah, but we, we're not even showing the slide for right now. Well, now, now it's just your... Okay, I've got a solution. One second. Thank you for your patience, folks. Absolutely. My biggest problem is Japanese beetle on my roses. I think you, I noticed the roses at the gardens look good. I mean, you don't do anything. Oh, really? We have a lot of wild grapevine that grows on the fence uh, between us and, and the highway. They prefer that. So kind of having like a, a trap crop, something else that they prefer. Um, but no, just hand picking as you see them and hand pick in the evening because they're a little dopier, you know, six, seven, eight o'clock in the evening and uh, drop them into a cup of water or just plain water and they'll drown, yeah. tap them off. Are they uh, oh, no. This July through, they're already they're already done. So we weren't sharing anything then. What, what <laughs> you had a delay. A projection on the video. I, I I understand why it looks good. How's this? That uh, should be good. That's good. It's a delay between. Yeah. All right, where do we want to be? All right. Uh, next slide, I guess, but now I have no notes. Okay. So, all right. <laughs> Okay, uh, here we go. So plants are uh, pretty important to us in our lives. Uh, they are the producers. They are providing the energy for every other living thing on the planet. So plants get eaten and we need to get over that, <laughs> basically. That's what's gonna happen. If you have a garden and you have plants, you're going to expect to have insects that just they have co-evolved together. And you can see they supply the energy for the rest of the food web. Right. And we're going to talk about some of these insects. Uh, they're going to fall into three broad categories that we're going to talk about today. There are others, but we'll focus on these three with three P's. They all start with P. We've got predators parasitoids, and of course, pollinators are very important that we feel there are, their activities are beneficial. Uh, you know, and it's not that the insects all got together and said, hey, let's help out the humans. No, this is what they do naturally. And we just happen to find 
those activities as we discover them are beneficial to us. So we'll start with the predators. And you might recognize some of these guys. These are uh, what I picked as being the most you know, visible, obvious, what you're likely to run into out in the gardens. So maybe praying mantis, uh, dragonflies or damselflies, lady beetles, you might call them ladybugs. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> but lady beetles, we're going to try and call them beetles because they are beetles. Uh, there is a specific order of insects, the Hemiptera, that are true bugs. That's kind of the name of the order. So we won't want to confuse them with the beetles. So these are lady beetles. Spiders, not technically insects because they have eight legs and two body parts, but very um, important for pest control. Uh, the pretty little lace wing. So, and there's more. There are hoverflies or surfid flies. We have some true bugs that are not plant eaters and they're actually predatory. Wasps and hornets we'll talk about. There are ground beetles, very, very fast, often shiny green. They will run down their prey on the ground. Uh, centipedes are predators. Uh, if you see uh, something like that with kind of longer legs and fewer legs, they are the centipedes. Millipedes have many, many more legs and segments, and they are uh, decomposers. They eat dead stuff. Uh, anybody recognize the uh, bug in this lower? That is a lanternfly or a firefly, lightning bug. Uh, its larva is predatory. Next slide, please. What does the larva eat? We'll show you in a second. <laughs> so I've been throwing some terms around about uh, insects and their different stages. So we'll do some review here. You all learned this in school, but we'll, we'll talk about it again. So complete metamorphosis, that's your butterflies, your beetles, your flies. They will start with an egg. They have larval stages and at each phase they will molt their skins and um, get a little bigger remember insects have an exoskeleton they can't grow the same way that we do they have to shed that skin and and harden a new one then they will pupate so that is the pupa stage and that is immobile until it does its full transformation into the adult so larval stages and adult stages look quite different all right. Some other insects have a more gradual metamorphosis, or it is also known as incomplete metamorphosis. So that will start with an egg, and then you'll have nymphal stages. Again, they're called instars, and they will molt and shed their skins until they get to the adult stage, where they'll have a complete set of wings. And at each stage, they look in body shape at least very similar to the adult. Um, they may be different colors and they may change colors throughout their stages, but that is gradual metamorphosis. And this is the true bugs. This is dragonflies. Um, and if I had my notes, I could tell you more. <laughs> but some insects have this type and some insects have this type, okay? Now looking at this slide and you'll see that it's it's got a lot of stuff going on here. This is common milkweed and it's late in the season, right? And uh, if you were to see that, what would you think? A good bug or bad bug? Do you think, you think it's a bad bug? It doesn't look good. It, doesn't look good. it really doesn't. It's a little bit frightening. It, they're always uh, orange and black of some degree. And it kind of looks like a little alligator. Well, that's a little bit frightening, but it is a good bug. That is the lady beetle's larval stage. And right next to it is another one, and that's the pupa. Yeah. So you can see we got well, all this junk on the leaf here are aphids, or aphid shed skins, or aphid poop, 
or this and that. So milkweed is a great plant to observe because there's always a lot of stuff going on. It almost always has aphids. And then the aphids will attract the ants and the flies and the wasps because of the honeydew that they produce. And then you almost always see lady beetles. All right. So this is a, a really good sign that you've got uh, reproducing insects in your yard. And of course, they need food. So that's why they're there. They're eating the aphids. They, the adult decided this is a good place to lay some eggs. So therefore, we've got larvae. And then they're going to transform into the adult and start the cycle all again. And there she is up close, our lady beetle, adult, and the larva. So once you get to recognize them, they're kind of cute and they are really good to have around. Next. All right, the hoverfly, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, it is a true fly, it only has one pair of wings, just two wings and really big eyeballs, all right? These hoverflies or surfed flies, they tend, they uh, mostly look like bees. So they are bee mimics. They are not bees, they will not sting you. Um, but they always have that color patterning and that's uh, a survival strategy. So predators of them will take pause and say, hey, maybe I'll get stung. So uh, it is the larval form of the surfed fly that is the predator and they too eat a lot of aphids and that's what it's got in its jaws right there and this is all aphids around it so it just piled right in there and grab some food the adults will uh, eat a little nectar and pollen and we'll talk about the importance of those plants later on all right and there's your lightning bug larva and it is eating, can you tell? A snail. It's okay. Cargo. Yeah. <laughs> so I have never actually seen one. So they're gonna be down in the leaf litter and, and stuff and underneath the plants and hiding out pretty good. I understand they also glow, right? Called glow worms. And there's, there's the adult, which is a beetle. It's not a fly at all. It is a type of beetle called leather wing beetles. And there's lots and lots of different species. Okay. Sorry, arachnophobes. <laughs> but here I have some spiders that you'll likely encounter in the garden. Again, not technically insects because they have eight legs and two main body parts as opposed to six and three. So uh, here's some favorites, uh, crab spiders, jumping spiders, I'm sure you've seen, wolf spiders running around the ground, and orb weavers, which you'll start to see in abundance this time of year in their webs, or you'll walk into their webs. Or <laughs> and then daddy long legs, which are spider related, but they're not true spiders. All right. So all of, all spiders will make a web. So are daddy long legs still arachnids, just not spiders? Or Correct. Okay. Yeah. Closer to uh, ticks and crabs and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, yeah. Are the ones that uh, you make their webs every every day? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So everybody here makes some kind of silk, except for daddy long legs. All right, uh, but not all of them use the silk for capturing prey, all right? The orb weavers kind of specialize in this and they are the ones that make the classic spider web, right? Uh, lots of different types. This is, happens to be the black and yellow garden spider. Um, so they are hoping that something flies and gets entangled into their net web. Crab spiders will hang out in a uh, flower blossom and they can camouflage themselves to match the color of that blossom. And uh, so they're ambush hunters. So they're gonna wait for something to visit. Uh, you know, and being predators, they don't really care what they eat. So they don't care if it's a lady beetle or 
a fly, you know, good bug, bad bug. They're just eating whatever they can catch, basically. Right. And I witnessed a crab spider in the blossom of a daylily, matched the color pretty close, and it had uh, a black swallowtail butterfly. Oh. <laughs> so my husband said, oh. And I'm like, hey, that's life. <laughs> that's how it goes. Are any of these insects like poisonous to humans or are they, you know? Any of these beneficials that I'm people, talking about? Like some people are scared of, of spiders. Oh, are, yeah. are any of these actually harmful? Uh, none of these, no. I mean, this, these can give you a pretty good bite, more like a bee sting. Remember, anybody is allergic to anything at any time. You, you just don't know. But none of these are, are venomous enough to create a problem. Uh, jumping spiders, I'm sure you're familiar with. Again, uses uh, just a drag line in case it falls off something, but uh, does not make a, a web to catch prey. So another ambush hunter, and they can, they can jump pretty good. And they're kind of fun to watch. They're never usually very big. And because uh, they will watch you and they will turn <laughs> and kind of follow you around and make sure you're not going to eat them. Wolf well, spiders come in various sizes, colors, and shapes, and they're always around the ground and they just run down their prey. You'll often see those in the garden. Next. All right. These are some of my photos. And this is a photo of a nursery spider. Uh, they are related to the very large fishing spiders that you might see around a pond or a lake. Uh, and they're called nursery spiders because they use their web not for catching prey, but to just protect their eggs and their spiderlings till they get big enough to disperse. And there they are, about a zillion of them. <laughs> Okay, the praying mantis, the mantids. Um, you may see this, they're becoming a little more rare. Not quite as uh, common as they used to be. If you see a brown one, that could very well be our native species, the Carolina mantid. The green ones that you might see are imports. They are not from around here. They've been introduced for pest control more 30 years ago, not so much these days. Turns out they're not that great at uh, pest control because if they don't have enough prey around, they're going to leave and uh, they often will eat each other if they have nothing else. But I understand that you still can get egg cases for praying mantis and, you know, have them kind of release naturally, but you got to have a lot of pests. You got to have a lot of bugs, stuff for them to eat. Next. All right. Lace wings, you might be familiar with. Uh, there's a green and there's a brown type. And the, again, the larvae are the predators. Not even sure the adults feed on anything. They're just going to mate and uh, you know start the cycle again. You might be able to recognize their eggs as they are on stalks on the leaf. And the theory behind that is when they start to hatch out that the first hatchings don't consume the other ones. <laughs> That's why they're on stocks, but kind of recognizable. Okay. All right, hornets and wasps. This is kind of our, our love-hate relationship here. So yes, hornets and wasps, they can sting you. They are, some of them are social insects, so they will have a, a small colony especially the paper wasps. But all of these guys are predators of other insects. So this one has um, a little caterpillar in its jaws and that's what they provide to their, their, their larva, uh, which are back in the nest, right? So good to have around, however, if you've got a paper nest right in close proximity to where, you know, human activities right at your doorway or something, that's going to be a problem for you. So you're going to need to remove that. Um, or if it's, you found it and it's 
out away and you can avoid it for the summer, avoid it. it they are not gonna return to that paper nest next year. Everybody's gonna die. The mated queen will go hibernate somewhere else and they do not return to that nest site. Right. Next. How about the yellow jackets? Would they come back to, like I had one in Seronga? Nope. Others make mud nests, others are solitary and they'll be uh, maybe in, in a ground nest in a hole. Some are live in, in trees, wood trees, wood uh, cavities. Uh, though it all depends on what you've got, if they have a small colony or if they're solitary. What do you know about like those, um, those hormone traps? How effective are those at catching wasps? For hornets and wasps, mm -hmm. I wasn't aware I had, they had hormones. Uh, I know there's like sugar traps because they're attracted to that, yeah. especially late in the season. Yeah, we've had, um, I'm a beekeeper, and so we've had hornets attack. We, they attacked our hives. hives last year. And so this year we ordered some hormone traps. They look like they're working. But I don't know if it's one of those things like the Japanese beetle traps where it looks like it's working, but it's actually attracting more wasps. Well, I guess it's all about placement. And um, so I don't know anything about that really. But um, as for the Japanese beetle traps, it's, you want to place it far away from whatever you're trying to protect. Mm -hmm. But, you know, not in your neighbor's yard. <laughs> that wouldn't be good. So other wasps, uh, and they can be very specific on what they are uh, hunting. Some are more generalized caterpillars. Some focus on grasshoppers and katydids. Others are strictly spider hunters. So what they're doing is dragging that carcass to their nest for the larva to feed on and then uh, be able to complete their life cycle. So stink bugs, you probably are familiar with some stink bugs that, that are not good guys, but there are some predatory stink bugs out there. And if you watch them closely or you look at them closely before you squish, uh, if they have very sharp pointed shoulders, if you will, uh, it's probably a predatory stink bug. So don't squish, but they do look very similar to the, the plant eaters. So. All right, next we're into parasitoids. And we don't have any questions yet, do we? Okay. Parasitoids, we probably heard of parasites, right? Your dog, cat might get parasites. Even humans get parasites. Uh, they will feed off their host, but they don't normally kill their host. Parasitoid is a little bit different. It will eventually kill its host. So good guy for, for us. So many kinds of different wasps and flies, and they will lay eggs on their host, the adults will. And when the eggs hatch, the little larva will burrow into their host, eat it from the inside out, burrow back out to pupate in their little uh, cocoons there. At this point, the host is dead. Well, that's pretty gruesome, huh? Yeah. <laughs> But lots of different different kinds, braconid wasps. And a little bit more about the life cycle here, okay? Laying eggs. Okay. And uh, more cocoons. So if you see a caterpillar like that, just leave it alone. That's, that's cool. Ichneumon wasps, these are quite large, so they're about more than an inch long, and they have a very long ovipositor. You can see that, which is drilling down through wood in search of a wood boring insect larva, like a beetle. And so it can not only detect that, but it can, you know, hit its target through the wood and lay an egg in that. So that's uh, pretty cool, pretty fun to see. I'll get at least one in the office a year. People going, what is this? <laughs> and it's, like, it's good, it's a good guy. And the other extreme is very, very tiny. So this tiny little wasp is laying an egg on a caterpillar egg. So that is how small that guy is. 
these are used a lot in uh, greenhouse production. Sorry. All right, tachinid flies. So these are kind of big, hairy, housefly looking guys that are, uh, one of them has been used, released for gypsy moth caterpillar control. So they will lay eggs on or near their host, um, maybe even on the leaf that the host is eating, where it will ingest the egg. And the same thing, the eggs will hatch, consume the, the host from the inside out, and then pupate. There are other types of parasitic flies. This is known as a feather leg fly. He's kind of cool. He looks a little bit like one of those hover flies, but a little bit different. Um, I understand this particular one was the parasitoid of brown marmorated stink bugs or squash bugs, one or the other. So that's neat. <clears throat> okay. Moving on to the pollinators, okay, kind of the, the star of the show here. Uh, lots of things can be pollinators. Anything that visits a flower for nectar or pollen will uh, accidentally pollinate. So there's beetles, there's butterflies, there's moths, there's flies, uh, even bats and birds, hummingbirds can be pollinators. But the real stars are the bees. And they really have adapted quite well to being pollinators. And what, what do you think about them? What's the feature about them that makes them good at being really efficient pollinators? Furry, Furry all over. They've got a lot of body hair. Most of them typically do. And then of course the pollen grains all stick all over them. So that makes them very efficient moving pollen from here to there. They also like to focus on one plant at a time while they're feeding. So they will uh, help to pollinate that species before they move on to something else. Of course, our famous honeybee, uh, who is not native to North America. So they, this is the European honeybee brought over with the colonists for their honey production, but very important for uh, our food production and pollination. Uh, bumblebees are quite familiar with lots and lots of species of those. They are native. And there's other guys, there's more solitary bees that uh, some are native, some are not. And, uh, but turned out to be the very important for our fruit production, especially orchards, orchard bees. We got leaf cutter bee. And this looks like a little sweat bee. But you'll see all these guys visiting flowers day to day. When you say something is a solitary bee, what makes that different from, let's say, a honeybee? Okay, honeybee. Honeybee is a social insect, so it has a, a massive hive with many, many members. And this is the only bee also that has a perennial hive. So those individuals will um, persist through the winter time, will overwinter alive. Um, most of these other guys will form, they either just take care of their own little um, nursery, if you will, five or six little baby bees in there that they're providing for. Bumblebees do a slightly larger colony, but they don't persist over the winter. So like the wasps and the hornets, you have a mated queen, she's going to go hibernate to start the cycle next spring. Everybody else is going to get killed off by the frost. Some things that we can do to help out are some of our solitary bees that need um, a little tube to um, raise their young in is provide some, some housing for them. So there are commercially made little bee houses with little paper straws, or you can make one out of a wood block of just um, untreated lumber and various size diameter holes. And what they'll use naturally is uh, hollow stems from plants or 
exit holes in dead wood from other insects, so things like that. So if you can provide some housing for them and some protection, that can help them out. And you can see all these types of guys visiting different, different flowers. So here we got a hoverfly. Yep, looks like a fat bee, but it's actually a fly. Uh, golden digger wasps. There's a moth, butterfly, ooh, and a bumblebee. Yeah. Wasp or hornet, there's a different moth. Tiny little bees. So they're all visiting these nice flowers. And we'll talk about the plants next. So any questions about the bugs? The walking sticks. I don't know the proper name, but they're also beneficial eating things. I don't know what they eat. Um, so they could be just eating. They could they could be eating plants, or they could be eating dead stuff. Or you know, they're if they're eating plants, they're just not numerous enough to cause a problem for us. So we don't consider them harmful. Sure. So aside from the pollinators, are, uh, are all of the other beneficial insects beneficial because they eat the things that eat our plants? Yeah, yeah, that's why we consider them the good guys. So if you see them, leave them alone. Yep, try to learn to recognize them and, you know, and look for that biocontrol when you've got a problem. Look, you know, if you see aphids, say, all right, I'm going to look and see if there's any lady beetles or maybe a uh, uh, Surfed fly or, or lacewing larva helping me out, you know. Sure. <laughs> so if you do set up a solitary bee house, would you take it down in the winter or do they overwinter in it? They overwinter in it. Okay. So we, I just set them up and, and leave them to, you know, um, so they'll, they'll get filled with either mud or, or whatever. And uh, the new bees will emerge in the springtime, but you always got comings and goings in the springtime. So I never want to <laughs> disrupt their activities. So I just leave it. I know other people who will um, collect those and overwinter them in the refrigerator and then put them back out in the springtime just so they don't get preyed upon during the winter or something happens, but I, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> So I'll provide you some housing. You got to do the rest. All right. Okay, let's move on to the plants then. Okay, again, so all of these guys need a little bit of pollen and nectar sometimes to supplement their diets. Of course, this is what bees are, are focused on. That's what they collect. But all these other predators will <clears throat> occasionally use pollen and nectar. Pollen is very high in protein, so good for them. And when prey is inadequate. And of course, nectar is, you know, high carb. So they will, some of these will, will switch to that later in the season, right? Like the wasps and hornets. And they need, you know, they need protection from the elements. So that's shelter. They need perches from which to hunt from. They need perches for which to mate. On. So they're using these plants in different ways. And um, we'll show you some of those that are quite important to these guys. Okay, three big families. So there's, there's lots and lots of plant families, right? But these three, um, very important to these types of insects because of the smallness of the flowers in clusters. All right, so APACA, which is now known, used to be known as umbelliferae or the carrot family. So think umbels, think uh, umbrella. Asteraceae used to be known as compositae, composite flowers. We can just call it the aster family now. And lamiaceae or the mints. And that used to be known as labiate, uh, meaning lip. So all the mints have a little pouty lower lip as a, a petal structure. All right. So we'll look at these guys more closely. So yes, think of umbels. Uh, 
So Queen Anne's lace, pretty classic umbelliferic flower. So lots of little bitty flowers in clusters. And that's what these smaller wasps, especially, and the flies are attracted to. Uh, more dill, uh, parsnip, carrots, those types of flowers. Not a lot of natives in this group. Uh, and some of the natives that we have, you probably don't want in your yard because it's uh, water hemlock, poison hemlock, mm -hmm. wild parsnip, and it's larger cousin giant hogweed. So probably don't want those around, but a lot of our vegetable plants fall into this, or our herbs fall into this category. So your dill, parsley, if you let it go to flower, um, cilantro. So I always like to have a patch of cilantro and just let it go to flower. Very attractive. So those are the umbels. And there's my patch of cilantro. So this is a four by four bed and it's just solely dedicated to cilantro. I let it go to seed, comes back next spring. And after I'm done harvesting, I let it go to flower and uh, that's where I see all these cool bugs. All right, the aster family or the composite. So what do I mean by composite? Composite is it's got kind of two different types of flowers combined into one blossom. So this head of a sunflower, these are all the little flowers actually. The ones on the outside edge are called ray flowers. And so they throw off a petal and you have different types. Let's just think daisies, daisy shape. Um, and we've got lots of them growing along the bank here. I see Rudbeckia and Echinacea, and um, they are all in the aster family. And here's some more examples of daisies. Of course, your asters, which will be blooming soon. Uh, even yarrow, even though it's in clusters, each little flower is a composite. All right, first, uh, black eyed Susans, cosmos, zinnias, marigolds, dandelions are all in this family. Some will have more petals than others, and others keep the classic you know, disc flowers and ray flower structure. More cosmos, um, coreopsis, uh, Jerusalem artichokes. This is cup plant, or echinacea over there, and even goldenrod. Again, little clusters, but they are little composites. All right, and then the mints. So you can see the um, classic little pouty lip there, that lower petal. Different shapes and sizes, like the Monarda, but they all have that form. And there are lots and lots of mints, as you know. Uh, we got thyme, lamium, uh, rosemary, basil is a mint. So all those things that you have growing around, maybe in containers around your house anyway, these are all good. Uh, let some of them go to flower. Oregano is very attractive or the bees, go ahead. This particular uh, mountain mint that we have growing at Cutler Gardens, it's at the south end of our native habitat area. Uh, not a very attractive flower, but wow, the whole clump of it, really attractive to bees and wasps, flies, and some cool predators like the ambush bug. I have found in there. So oh, that's fun to just kind of stand back and watch. Other good choices, anything uh, with those small flowers, different shapes and sizes. So the onions, alliums, if you get spring chives, if you've got the ornamental onions, those are great. Uh, comfrey, always attractive to the bees and borage. So you have things flowering at different times. Chives are very early, so that's good. Uh, and keep it going right through the season. Milkweeds, 
always good. Uh, not just for the monarch butterfly, but you can see we've got flies on them, uh, moths, bees, uh, a stilby and the saxifrage family. Lots and lots of clusters of tiny flowers, very good. And mustards. So some of those are very early flowering, so that is good for those bees that are just emerging. And, you know, diversify. So don't forget about trees and shrubs as well. There are many, many nice flowering trees and shrubs that you can have. Uh, this is nine bark, all right? Nice little flower clusters. And, you know, again, break it up, um, mix it up, mix it around, make sure you have something blooming all season long. Don't forget about your lawn. So your lawn can either be kind of a food desert to uh, these insects, being just grass. Grass, of course, is wind pollinated. It doesn't attract insects. Uh, but if you mix in some white clover and some other things, or, you know, <laughs> just don't do a very good job at lawn care, and these things will come naturally. Uh, this happens to be my lawn, and it's about 50% grass and 50% other things. And, but the bees are working over it constantly. So, and, you know, now it's trendy. It's a bee lawn. Pop up within a few days again, they? Oh, yeah, 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 few more, yeah, few, and you don't get them all. So, all right, so we talked about a lot of these things, try to have a lot of plants that uh, will be blooming spring through fall. Native plants are a good choice because these species will attract, of course, native insects, which can attract native wildlife, and they are less likely to become agricultural weeds. Um, place plants in groups rather than single specimens. So we got a nice uh, grouping of Rudbeckia over there. That's more attractive than a single specimen. Water is important again to all these insects. So a bird bath or a water feature can be attractive. Small patches of bare earth, if you have them, um, those are good for the ground nesting type bees. And again, they may look like you've got a lot of them in a space and they're gonna be a threat to you, but they're, they're very unaggressive and um, they're more communal. So they're each taking care of their individual nest, but they'll use, um, you know, if it's a good site, you'll have more than one using that. Uh, you know, beware of pesticide use. Just, um, if you've got a pest problem, try to assess it. If, do you really need to act or do you not? You know, again, look for those beneficials if they're there. If you use a pesticide, it's a broad spectrum kind of insect killer. It's gonna hurt the good guys too. So try to avoid that or try some very safer alternatives, things that are more specified, such as like BT. Uh, it's a bacteria that will affect just caterpillars that eat it. So things like that. And tolerate minor pest infections because these are food for your beneficial insects. So they need something to eat or they're not going to hang around. Um, there are things that can uh, eat the larva when they're in the soil. Okay. But probably not as bad as you think. <laughs> right? I know. I know, but again, low tolerance. Again, plants get eaten. They can tolerate a lot of damage more than you think. And we just got to kind of get over it. Next, one more slide. Yeah. Yeah. So here we got uh, this is tomatillos, and it's got this um, three lined potato beetle feeding on it and laying eggs. But upon closer expect inspection, we have pink lady beetle, and she's going to. It's going to help take care of that. So, and this is not this is not all that injurious to the plant. Okay, so. Is there any way to uh, track the cute insects, <laughs> lady beetles, and not not the spiders? <laughs> uh, no. no. 
so take them all and what's you know not cute to you might be cute to somebody else that's cute. right so <laughs> No, uh, you know, and I used to be a terrible arachnophobe. I, yeah. but you know, and I grew up on a farm, so that is not right. But my older siblings tortured me. So anyway, uh, <laughs> I did, I did. So the more you learn about something, the more familiar you become with it, the less frightening it is. So you know, take a pause and uh, instead of stomping, watch it for a so few. Okay. Hey, right, right. You know, in their house, that's a little different, but outdoors, try to, you know, have some tolerance, walk away. All right. So, well, thank you all for your attention. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That is the end of my presentation. I have a question about the impact of birds on insects. Are they? Well, they. They are indiscriminate as well, though, so they will catch whatever they can eat, but um, they are very good at, you know, controlling the numbers. So all this, all these layers in the food web, that's all about population control and a nice balance occurs when we have a healthy ecosystem. But then we have human activity that kind of mucks that up. Do hummingbirds help with pollination? They do. Yeah. Yep. So those certain tubular flowers that they are attracted to sometimes that's the only thing that can pollinate that that plant so and um, but they're also insect eaters so they'll eat tiny flying insects is there any evidence that climate change is impacting beneficial insects probably yes uh just with the introduction of other species and moving into this area um yeah, I'm sure it's got all kinds of impacts, unfortunately. Uh, for, you know, for insect species across the board. What's a pretty one that's such a pest now and it's coming into Pennsylvania? Spotted lantern fly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty, yes. Yeah, uh, the trees, so yeah it's a sap sucker. So it'll feed off the trees, more like a parasite, doesn't, doesn't kill them outright, but... Um, you know, weakens them, sets them up for winter injury, maybe. So not good, not good for, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's our thing. Oh, is it ugly or is it pretty? And <laughs> do we say, you know, there's some, there's some bad butterflies out there, right? But everybody loves butterflies, but that's your cabbage moths, right? Yeah. <laughs> Are there insects that are beneficial in one stage and then harmful in another stage? Not that I can think of. Um, no. So um, usually it's either one stage or maybe it's both. You know, so sometimes adults feed as well as their larva. Um, Sometimes it's just the larva, but you know, larva are like eating machines, whether it's plant eater or it has to eat. What kind of um, pets do centipedes eat? Probably anything they can run down. Because they're pretty quick, right? Yeah. So if I uh, see one in my house, instead of screaming <laughs> and instead of like a girl in my house, I can just <laughs> let it do its thing. If you can tolerate it, or you can try to catch it. No, that's, no not that's not gonna happen. And take it outside. Um, but yeah, <laughs> but tolerance. tolerance. Something worse in my house that the centipede wants to eat. Could be, okay. or it just you know wandered in by accident. That happens all the time. Yeah, right. So you may not. You probably don't have a breeding population in your house. But again, these occasional invaders. Like what can people do? Let's say you live in an apartment building and you don't have a garden or a yard. Are there things that people can do to help support beneficial insect, insects? Yeah, you can help support your uh, local botanic garden because yeah. <laughs> we have them all. Uh, or, you know, maybe you can have containers on your, on your pat deck, patio, whatever, and uh, have some flowers there. Uh, any small pocket in an urban 
setting can be helpful. So. Yeah, supporting supporting your, your local farmer's market or- you Yeah, know, all that, or your community garden, garden spases. <laughs> no? so uh, your green spaces, you know, the parks and, and things. Your zoo, your local zoo. Your local zoo, Ross Park Zoo. <laughs> well, uh, Okay. Thank, Linda, thank you so much. I think this is a really educational workshop and uh, we have the recording so we can reach even more people. Great. Than we reach today. Great. So thank you so much for all of your help. And oh, you're welcome. Audience members, thank you for your questions. <laughs> thank all you. right. Thank you. So these are all available, like, even if you didn't go to it, you can get it. Mm -hmm. So everything is available on the Vines YouTube channel, which you can access. Oh, YouTube. Mm -hmm. you, got it, uh, you can go on YouTube and Google vinesgardens.org and it'll we'll come up. Or just go to the Vines website. Go to vinesgardens.org backslash education. And you'll see an archive of all of our videos. And that's free. That's free to anybody. That's it. So you are not afraid of wolf spiders anymore? Thank you. I'm not going to pick them up, but I will not, you know.